So we have Apple and Pear. They organized Marzipan General Partnership in the current year to acquire and develop attractive land. Each contributed $20 to the partnership for a 50% interest in capital, profits, and losses. The partnership purchased the land from a third party for $200. It paid the price with the funds contributed by the partners and a mortgage loan of $160. Assume that under local law, Apple and Pear are each jointly and severally liable to repay the mortgage, including interest, if the partnership cannot pay it. The partnership agreement contains the appropriate capital account deficit restoration provisions under Reg 1.704-1. Now, the partnership engaged in no transactions during the year other than the purchase of the land. What is the basis of each partner's interest at the end of the current year? All right, so we're focusing on this question first. What is the basis of each partner's interest at the end of the year, end of the current year? And we're going through the facts given on formation as well as what's going on. So we got two partners here, right? Apple and Pear. They each contribute $20 to the partnership. And the partnership also borrows $160. And so there's $20 from Apple, $20 from Pear, and then we have $160 liability from a lender. That's $200 total. That $200 is then used to purchase land. So if we have a balance sheet on formation, right? We've got our assets. The only asset we have is land. It's got a adjusted basis of 200 it's got a book value or book amount of 200 we have liabilities of 160 and then we also have the capital accounts of a and p and those amounts are going to be 2020 20, 20 and 20 and assets equal liabilities plus capital or owner's equity. So we're good there. So that's what the balance sheet looks like. So this question, we know that on section 721 formation, we know that 722 and 723, we know that the partners take $20 bases for the cash they contribute, and the partnership, of course, takes $20 in the cash they receive. But the real question here is, what about this $160 of loan? How is that allocated between the $160 alone, how is that allocated between Apple and Pear? Now, liability allocations, remember that under Section 752, liabilities go into basis. And that matters because later on, when the partners have losses or distributions, it makes a big difference in the tax consequences there, right? You can take more losses if you have more basis or less of the distributions taxed less of the cash distributions taxed. So we complete the analysis of how to bring up the liabilities each year. Now we're specifically asked in this question just at the end of year one, at the end of the year of formation. Now it makes it really easy in this one because in this respective question, there's no transactions that happen. It's land, so there's no depreciation. It makes it really, really simple. So another way to, to uh, phrase this specific question is how is the liability allocated, the $160 of liability that the partnership takes on? How is that allocated among the partners for basis purposes? So remember that when it comes to liabilities in the tax law for partnership tax, there's two types, Reg 1.752-1 and Reg 1.752-7. Dash 7 is contingent liabilities. There's no contingent liability here. They've taken out the money, and it's, it's a pretty plain vanilla liability. So we've got our Reg 1.752-1 plain vanilla liability. So the question is, who bears the risk? Who bears the economic risk of loss with respect to the liability? Now, if we look at the facts... Let's go back to our facts. And again, when we look at who bears the economic risk, the most important thing to focus on is the partnership agreement. We're told to assume, and this is very important, assume that under local law, that Apple and Pear, which are both general partners, are each jointly and severally liable to repay the mortgage. So that language right there, that language, that sounds like a recourse mortgage. Now notice that nowhere in this, this problem does it tell us whether it's a recourse or non-recourse mortgage. And in practice, sometimes it's not clear as well. So here, the fact that they're both general partners and they're responsible for making up as partners individually, making up jointly and severally, they're liable to repay that mortgage. That makes it recourse. That means that it's going to go 
unlimited liability. It's not limited liability like a non-recourse where, hey, the the partners can just walk away if the if the um, if the land goes down in value and then the lender now bears the risk. Nope. This is a recourse because they are responsible. They have to pay regardless. Okay. So let's go back to our chart. And since we have a recourse liability, remember recourse liability, that means that someone bears the economic risk. Here it's both partners because they're jointly and severally liable. Now we talked about partnership agreement. We talked about local law. There's nothing about guarantees, indemnifications, pledges so far on this problem. We might have that issue later. We'll talk about that later on. So under Reg 1.752-5, sorry, under Reg 1.752-2, we have five steps, and we call this the hypothetical end of the world liquidation, where everything is worth zero. So all liabilities are due and payable in full. So at the end of the year, that $160 liability is payable back to the lender. The um, partnership has to pay it back. All assets become worthless. So all the assets are going to be sold off. We've got the land, which has a $200 book value. Now it's being sold for zero. All assets are disposed of for zero. So we're selling that. So now we have a $200 loss. So that results in a $200 loss. Then the partnership allocates all of the items as of the last day. So here we have to allocate the $200 loss. We have to allocate this loss. And then finally, the partnership liquidates, and we have to determine who's responsible for what at the end of the day when, we cl when everything clears, all the, set the dust settles. Okay. So going through those steps, again, step one, the $160 liability becomes due. So we got to pay, we got to pay off the uh, liability to the, uh, the third party that we borrowed it from. And we're assuming that we're selling the land for zero. So that means we have a $200 loss, $200 loss. Now we're told on the last sentence, the partnership agreement contains the appropriate capital account deficit restoration provisions under reg 1.704-1. That means that it's going to meet the basic test, the basic test, which remember the basic test, there's three requirements under reg 1.704-1. You need to maintain capital accounts in accordance with reg 1.704-1b2, uh, little iv. You have to have a liquidated in accordance with positive capital account balances and an unlimited deficit restoration. So we're saying all three of those are in place. So that $200 loss, we're told that everything is split 50-50 with respect to the owners. Now, when you're doing liability allocation, you're doing this analysis, it helps to do a capital account analysis. So let's go ahead. We're going to call this uh, part of the problem. Let's, let's label it right here. Um, we'll call this part uh, one of the problem. And this is just the basic level. right? We've got two owners. We've got Apple and Pear, and we need to show their capital accounts. So we're looking at book. We focus on book capital accounts, capital account analysis, just book capital account analysis. So initially, on contribution, they contributed 20, so we start off with 20. No other events have occurred during the year, so there's not any depreciation. There's no you know, income coming in, no expenses. It's just pretty much they're buying this land, speculating that it'll go up in value, nothing else. Okay? And now we have the $200 loss at the end of the year because we're assuming, again, this in order to determine the how we, how we break up this liability, it's this hypothetical end of the world liquidation. So that $200 loss, according to the partnership agreement, is going to be split 50-50. So $100, $100 between the two owners. So let's go ahead and do that. So we give them $100 and $100. Okay. That leaves us with negative 80 and negative 80. And if, again, we're following the three requirements of the basic test, the three requirements of the basic test, remember, we follow capital counts, which we've done that. We liquidate in accordance with positive capital count balances. We don't have, we don't have positive, we have negative. And then if we have, we have unlimited deficit, which means that, hey, if the partners are negative on liquidation, which remember is step five of this process, then the partners are required to contribute. So A is required to contribute $80 cash, P $80, and guess what? That equals $160, and that's what pays off the loan. So that all works out economically, and that is how we break up the liability. So in this situation, the liability is broken up 80-80. Another way to look at this is in each situation, we have 160 of liability. In situation 1, 80 and 80, 80 to A, 80 to P in that order. 
So the question is asking, what's the partner's uh, basis of each interest? Well, we add 20 onto that, right? Because the adjusted basis for apple and pear, we start with the 20, and now we've just added 80 on. So their basis at the end of the year is 100, 100. Now, this can change each year based on what's going on economically, so keep that in mind. So we've just went ahead and answered number one. That's the answer to number one. Now let's go on. There's another hypothetical, and let's call this one number two. So number two asks, what if the partnership had borrowed $160 from Apple or had purchased the property from Apple on deferred payment basis, in each case giving Apple its $160 recourse obligation? So what this one actually ends up being like or similar to is it's similar to the idea that if no one else was to bear the risk, like if this was a non-recourse liability, if it was non-recourse, which we know again it's recourse, but it was non-recourse, then this would make Apple the recourse because Apple is now the lender. And if it's not recourse and no one bears the economic risk, and now Apple bears the risk because Apple is the lender, then it would all be allocated to Apple. However, it's a recourse liability, so it makes a big difference. If we go down to our reg 1.752-1, who bears the economic risk of loss? Remember, recourse liability, someone bears a risk. And we have our three elements. We focus on the partnership agreement, local law, and then satisfaction presumption. The satisfaction presumption, whenever we have a recourse liability with any kind of guarantee um, or one of the partners is a lender, we pretty much assume that, hey, all the partners are going to make good. Now, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know, hey, is B going to default in the future? And then A has to make that up because um, B can't goes bankrupt or something. We don't know that. But the idea is that in the regs, uh, the IRS and Treasury, they say we're going to the, the satisfaction presumption assumes that the parties will make good and actually pay off what they owe, which again is the idea of recourse liabilities. So the idea here is in two, what if the partnership had borrowed $160 from Apple or purchased the property from Apple on a deferred basis? Again, if it was non-recourse, now we have some change because now it's going to be fully recourse with respect to Apple and then you allocate all of the non-recourse liability, all of it, all the liability goes to Apple because now the recourse, it's now considered recourse and then Apple would make it up if you did the hypothetical um, end of the world five-step liquidation. But it's not. This is still a recourse liability and because of that, it's actually the same the same result as number one. It's the same exact result as number one because the idea is, again, the satisfaction presumption says that A and B are still going to pay going forward, and we go through the same five steps, and it results in the same way, 80, right, negative 80, negative 80 on liquidation, and then they're going to have to contribute that to make up for the 160 they owe um, because the partnership had to pay out of pocket, and then they re get reimbursed, and then the idea is that their basis is still 100-100. All right, let's go to the last part of the question, which I'm going to call number three. And it says, what if Apple contributed $40 and Pear contributed no initial capital, but they still agree to share profits and losses equally? All right, so at first, you're thinking, hmm, this might not change much. Because if you think about the items, right, the only thing that this should change, it looks like at least, is the adjusted basis. This will change from... Apple now has 40, right? Contributes $40 of cash, and Pear contributes zero. And you still think, oh, 80, 80. But actually, that is not true. That is not true. This that will that is true that it'll be 40, zero, but you're gonna see it. This is gonna change. It's no longer gonna be 80, 80. And the reason why is because of those five steps from the hypothetical liquidation. So nothing has changed in terms of the facts. Everything is still the same. The only thing that changes is now. A contributes $40 cash, and P contributes uh, no money. But it's still the liability and still gains and losses, everything uh, per the partnership agreement. Um, it looks like 50-50. So we have to go through the, the five steps again. right? Let's consider our five steps. So again, all assets are, all liabilities are due and payable, $160. All assets become worthless, zero. All assets are disposed of for um, $0. That gives us a $200 loss. So, so far, same thing. Partnership allocates all items as of the last day. So, we allocate out and then partnership liquidates. So, let's see how that, that changes the capital accounts. So, that's where, that's where it changes is the capital analysis. And that's why the capital analysis is so important when you do these steps. So, we're going to change this now for A and P. So, A is contributing 40. P is contributing 0. Now, the loss is still split. 50-50 because that still is part of the partnership agreement, 
right? 50-50, still 50-50. And again, it still meets substantial economic effect under Reg 1.704-1. So that changes our calculation in the end. It's no longer 80-80. Now it's negative 60, negative 100. Okay. Now it's negative 60, negative 100. So this would be the amount of cash that is needed by the partners, Apple and Pear, right, AMP, if the partnership liquidated hypothetically and there was no and book and the book value was zero. So that means we're going to take the $160 of liability and we are going to allocate that. We're going to break it. Apple is going to be allocated 60 because again, the negative capital account balances per the partnership agreement on liquidation, they have to restore those amounts. So Apple would have to give $60 of cash. Pear would have to give $100 of cash. So that $160 of liability is going to be born. $60 to Apple, $100 to Pear in that order. And then we're going to come up here and we're going to change around the basis now and how we break up that liability. Right now it's one, it's $160. I'm sorry, $60 to Apple, $100 to Pear. Right? So we've got Sixty to Apple, one hundred pair, and that brings our liability amounts. I'm sorry, our basis amounts, ending basis, to one hundred and one hundred. Now notice that in the end, they get the same as in. So number one, the adjust, and number two, the adjusted bases are one hundred and one hundred. In the end, same thing. Same thing in three. 100, 100, the adjusted basis. But notice the liability is broken up differently, so it makes a big difference. And the reason, if you look at a K-1, pull up a K-1 for Form 1065, you are going to see that the amount of the liability is broken up between the owners. It actually says, oh, your portion of liability. So it actually would be broken up. So it is important to note, you're saying, okay, well, the adjusted basis and number one, two, and three, they all end up 100, 100, 100. I'm sorry, 100, 100 in both situations. And you're right, they do. I mean, if I could change up facts, it could be different. We could allocate all the liability to one, again, if there was some type of non-recourse of a guarantee, like if we had number two of a non-recourse liability. And we'll see that in a later problem. But the idea here is that the liability is different. It was 80 and 80 and number one, number two. Now it's 60 and 100. Yes, it does. Um, the adjusted bases are equal, but the liability changes. Makes a big difference. All right. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Again, go back over this. Also, make sure you use this chart. I have this video that goes over the rules. This analysis is very important. If you're going through the analysis we just did, yes, you got to go do the capital account analysis and also show the basis. So show those bases for each situation. Show the capital account analysis for each situation. But also, you want to go through and show the rules, how everything fits together. This is also very important, starting with, okay, it's a reg 1.752-1. One liability, who bears the economic risk of loss? You want to then determine if it's recourse or non-recourse. Explain recourse is um, somebody bears the economic risk or multiple people do. Non-recourse is nobody does. And then go through whatever it is. Also, you want to note, hey, these three elements in the middle here, they have a big impact on these items. Hope you've enjoyed this. Please watch the other videos that are go along with this topic.